Welcome to the Exam Room Live, brought to you by the Physicians Committee. Hi, I am the weight loss champion, Chuck Carroll, and this... This right here is the healthiest half hour anywhere online today. Appreciate you joining us right here on Facebook and on YouTube. So let us set the table for this fantastic Friday. You know, there is a lot of chitter chatter about omega-3s and plant-based diets this week after singer and actress Miley Cyrus announced she's reintroducing fish into her diet following many years of being vegan. So what are the options for vegans to get omega-3s? We'll find out when we're joined by Dr. Jim Loomis. Dr. Loomis, a ton of chat about this this week, and I know that you're going to shed a lot of light on this for us. Looking forward to it, Chuck. And he's going to be sticking around as well to tackle your other health and nutrition questions when we open up the doctor's mailbag. So let's go ahead and fill that up. Go ahead and post yours in the comments now or drop us a line on social at Physicians Committee and at Chuck Carroll WLC on Instagram. Just make sure to choose that hashtag exam room live. But first, before we go any further, let's get a check of your health headlines on this Friday, September 4th, 2020. And we do begin with the coronavirus and the tally board there. The U.S. now reporting more than 44,000 new cases Thursday, bringing the total number of infections close to 6.2 million as the death toll climbs past 186,000 with more than 1,000 fatalities reported yesterday. Still, metrics for the virus in the U.S. continue trending downward. Wait for it. There we go. If you're getting plenty of vitamin D, new research shows you may be at less risk for COVID-19. In a study of nearly 500 patients, those who went untreated for vitamin D deficiency were almost twice as likely to test positive for the virus. The findings from the University of Chicago study are in line with previous research, which showed vitamin D can lower the risk of other viral respiratory tract infections. The study points out half of all Americans are believed to be deficient in that vitamin. And as we get set to enjoy a long weekend, you may be dreaming of getting a few extra hours of shut-eye. And that's a good thing. In a study of adults in their 60s through 80s, researchers were able to estimate when a person may develop Alzheimer's disease based on the quality of their sleep. The study finds those who got more uninterrupted deep sleep had less buildup of toxic plaque known as beta amyloid on the brain. And that plaque plays a key role in the development of Alzheimer's, said neuroscientist Matthew Walker, quote, we have found that the sleep you're having right now is almost like a crystal ball telling you when and how fast Alzheimer's will develop in your brain. Moving on now, today's big story, vegans and omega-3s. Oh my. Longtime vegan Miley Cyrus stunning the plant-based community this week by announcing she was transitioning to a pescatarian diet and now eating fish for the first time in years. She says that her brain just wasn't as sharp when she was eating a vegan diet, chalking that up to malnutrition because she wasn't getting enough omega-3s. So that then begs the question, is Cyrus singing the right key or is her thinking a little flat? Is it possible for vegans to get enough omega-3s in their diet without resorting to fish? And if so, how do they do it? For that, we welcome Dr. Jim Loomis to the exam room live. He is the medical director for the Barnard Medical Center and the man that is featured in the Game Changers documentary. Dr. Loomis, welcome to the program, my friend. Thanks, Chuck. Once again, happy to be here. You are the man. Now let's start from the top. And first, before we get into sources of omega-3s, let's start with what omega-3s actually are and what role they play in our health. So uh, omega-3 fatty acids, um, th there's two major types of, of, uh, of, of long chain fatty acids. There's omega-6 fatty acids, omega-3 fatty acids. Omega-6 fatty acids are the precursors for, for, for uh, uh, substances in our bodies like leukotrienes and prostaglandins, which, which create primarily inflammation. And omega-3s are the precursors for, for compounds that are anti-inflammatory. Now, remember, we, we do need to have some inflammation because we need to fight infections and heal wounds and, and, and things like that. And in fact, we, we have an evolutionary preference for omega-6 fatty acids. Um, and it's uh, because inflammation was important to keep us around that we could find our next, next meal uh, before we starve to death. Um, and it's felt that the optimum dietary ratio of omega-6 to omega-3, as best as we can tell, is, is less than five to one, probably in the two to three to one range, omega-6 over omega-3. Um, and um, so it's about finding that kind of balance between inflammation and anti-inflammatory. Um, 
if you look at the omega-6 intake in kind of a standard Western diet um, or an unhealthy vegan diet, which includes a lot of vegan junk food and fried foods and edible oils and, and things like that, or meat and dairy, um, you, you can see omega-6, omega-3 ratios in the, in the to one range. So, so these diets are, can be highly inflammatory. Um, and, you know, again, the omega-3s, besides being anti, besides being anti-inflammatory, also play a role in, you know, nerve health, brain health, um, um, in a variety of other um, uh, parts of our physiology. Um, so, you know, the key is, is, is to, to be truly healthy, the key is, is to not only ensure you get enough omega-3 in your diet, but it's also being sure that you're not over consuming the omega-6. So that, that balance, again, that balance, that ratio is in that kind of two to five to one range. Can you overdo it with omega-3s? Is, I know that there's some talk uh, about that with some other vitamins, like too much is too much. Is that the case with omega-3s? Yeah, I don't know of any research to suggest that, that over consuming omega-3s is, is somehow harmful. Um, you know, the, 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 here, here's part of the problem with, with even omega-3 supplementation. We can talk a little bit more about plant-based versus fish oil and where omega-3s come from in just a minute. But one of the problems we have is, is that um, typically what we ingest in our food are the short-chain fatty acids. So it's um, alpha-linoic acid and linoleic acid on, on each side of that equation. And those get elongated uh, through, a, through a series of inter intermediate um, compounds to arachidonic acid on the omega-6 side, which is the precursor to the actual inflammatory um, uh, prostaglandins and leukotrienes. And on the omega-3 side, uh, they get elongated to DHA and EPA. And those are the precursors for the anti-inflammatory compounds. But it turns out that the enzymes that, that elongate these fatty acids, are they compete for each other's attention. It's the same enzymes. And because we have an evolutionary preference for inflammation, when we overconsume these omega sixes, we can't. Even if you have an adequate intake of omega threes, you still can't um, convert all of them to. You can't convert all the omega three you ingest to these uh, anti-inflammatory compounds. So there's kind of two sides to the equation here. I know we're we're focusing here on on how do you get plenty of omega threes, but it's very important to understand that you also need to. Uh, minimize or, or decrease your omega-6 intake. Now, all of these are actually plant-derived, as a matter of fact. Um, now, the major source of, of omega-6 fatty acids in the, in the human diet is, is primarily meat and dairy, but it's because of mainly what we feed the pigs and chickens and, and cows today, um, um, which, which markedly increases the omega-6 content in the meat. Um, Corn oil, for example, and oftentimes corn oil is mixed in with feed to fatten the cows up quicker, has an 83 to 1 omega-6, omega-3 ratio, but probably one of the most inflammatory edible oils you can, you can, um, 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 you can consume. Um, the, um, um, but we, even on a plant-based diet, though, we see fairly high omega-6, omega-3 ratios in many of the edible oils, including olive oil, for example, which is like 13 to 2. So that's still above that optimum 5 to 1 or 3 to 1, 5 to 1 ratio. Um, on the omega-3 side, um, the, these are, we, those are also plant-derived. Um, you find the high levels in things like pumpkin seeds and, and um, uh, flax seed, chia seed, um, uh, hemp seed, even green leafy vegetables. Um, now, people talk about using fish oil as a supplement, but, it, but, but where the omega-3s come from in fish down the food chain is actually from marine phytoplankton and algae, which is, is, is plant-derived. So, so again, both on the omega-6 and the omega-3 side, ultimately, uh, the, the source, is, they're all plant-based um, 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 in origin. Okay. Well, let's, let's talk a little bit more about those sources. So you said uh, for omega-3s, you can find them in, in green leafy vegetables. I'm assuming you're meaning spinach, you're meaning uh -huh. kale. Are there any others there? Yeah. So most green leafy, most, we don't think of, of vegetables having fat in it, but they do. It's not, not very much, but there, but there is fat and it's primarily in the form of, of omega-3 fatty acids, the healthy ones. The, the, the best sources are, are you know, things like flaxseed, chia seed, and hemp seed. Uh, walnuts also have um, 
have a fair amount of omega-3. Pumpkin seeds have a fair amount of omega-3. So with some diligence, um, it, it's very easy to get plenty of omega-3s um, uh, uh, just through the food that we eat. Now, you know, on occasion, and, and the, the, I do recommend that some people take a supplement. Um, um, and there's, a, there's some controversy in the kind of plant-based vegan community about the need for doing that. I, I think part of that lies in the fact that we don't pay enough attention to decreasing the omega-6 intake, right? So, so, to, so to bring that, that ratio back into balance, you know, you got to lower the omega-6, increase your omega-3. So, and some people have a hard time doing that because edible oils are so ubiquitous in, in, in our diet. I mean, you can go to Trader Joe's and get a really healthy looking thing of uh, lentil chips, which are, you know, have lots of um, um, edible oil added, fat added. Um, so, um, so, and some athletes take it kind of because it is kind of anti-inflammatory. Um, but again, you don't need to use fish oil. That you can you can take algae based omega three uh, fatty acid supplement, and what you're looking for is one that has about 300 350 milligrams of the DHA component. Um, and um, um, now, if you're if you follow kind of an SOS, a salt oil sugar free plant based diet, um, then you probably because your omega six intake is so low, you probably don't need to worry so much about about a supplement. Um, so you mentioned omega sixes and oils there. So what are some other sources of omega sixes that we should be looking out for? Well, it's mainly again, if you they're all plant derived, and these are it's mainly from edible oils. Um, you know, and and if so, if you go down the list, like I said, corn oil's eighty three to one, um, um, olive oils is I think thirteen to two, um, and then and most of all the other edible oils are are somewhere in that either uh, or between the two, right? Um, you know, people talk about what about coconut oil doesn't, you know, or something like that where there's no omega-6 in it, but that's all saturated. There's no omega-3 either. It's all saturated fat, which is not, if you want to use olive oil, I mean, coconut oil, put it on your skin. It's not something we should be ingesting. So um, um, most, almost all the edible oils though, have a fairly high omega-6, omega-3 ratio. There's some other reasons, even for the ones like canola oil, which where that ratio is a little bit lower. There's some other reasons not to be consuming a lot of oil um, um, for, from a health standpoint, re re relating to nutrient density and, and just the calories from fat and things like that. I want to stick with the fish thing here because there's also, you know, this, this underlying belief that, you know, fish is definitely something that you need to have a healthy heart, keep the ticker beating nice and healthfully. Um, is there something fishy to that claim? And can you have just as healthy of a heart without being a pescatarian? Well, of course. I mean, you know, when you eat a piece of fish, we're, you know, the nutrients that we get from the fish, right? It's just protein, fat, there is saturated fat. Uh, and then, but, and there's some healthy fats, so maybe three, where did all that come from? Well, it came from what the fish ate, right? Just like what's in a hamburger came from what the cow ate or what's in milk came from the, what the cow ate. Well, if you, if you, again, if you go, depending on the, the species of fish and what they eat, if you, if you follow that down the food chain, ultimately, just like in a cow who's eating plants, eating grass, the fish are eating plants in the form of marine phytoplankton and algae. Now they might eat krill or shrimp, but the shrimp are eating the marine phytoplankton and algae. So ultimately these are all plant-based, right? Um, and again, you know, to that point, when we think about nutrient density, if, 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 you know, when we have extra money, we want to invest it in our financial future. We're looking for a positive return on investment for our money. When we think about our calories, we should think about our calories that way. If you have 100 calories to spend in the moment and you could spend it on, you know, a, a healthy oil or a piece of salmon or some broccoli, you know, what's your nutritional return on investment for that? Well, 100 calories of oil is a tablespoon, right? It doesn't take up any space in your stomach. And as I already said, what do you get back? Fat. That's it. No fiber, no protein, no cancer fighting phytonutrients. You know, no. Um, 100 calories of salmon is an ounce. Doesn't take much space in your stomach. What do you get back from that? Protein, fat right? No fiber, no potassium to lower your blood pressure, no healthy cancer-fighting phytonutrients, antioxidants. 100 calories of broccoli, there's omega-3s, almost as much protein as an egg, lots and lots of fiber, and it's got compounds that have been clinically shown to help prevent many cancers, including colon cancer. So, so again, when we frame it, when we frame it, reframe oils and or fish through the lens of nutrient density, I think you can make a pretty strong case 
that, that we just don't need to eat that. And then, and there's a couple other reasons with fish though. So fish is almost all the fish today that's commercially caught, especially the fattier fishes are highly contaminated with heavy metals, um, particularly mercury. Um, and, you know, is eating a piece of fish once a week going to kill you? Of course it's not. Are you exposing yourself to these toxins? Yes, you are. Is it enough to hurt you? Who knows? It probably depends on the source of the fish and such as that. But I'm also, I, there's some also some very serious environmental concerns about the over, about overfishing and, and the depletion of, of, of uh, fish stocks really around the world, seafood stocks. There are some people who believe that if we don't change our current consumption um, and, and, and the fish, the way we in fishing, or, or taking too many fish from the ocean, the fisheries could collapse by mid-century and that, that would have catastrophic consequences environmentally, socially, um, you know, around the world. So, you know, for me, I think there's several reasons not to eat fish. So there's the environmental reasons, the environmental toxin reason, you know, animals, fish probably feel pain, which is, you know, it's not very compassionate and, um, and we just don't need it. All right. Let's uh, let's wrap this up before we open up the doctor's mailbag. And again, you can post your question for Dr. Loomis in the comment section right now or tweet that to us using the hashtag exam room live. So let's dial it back. Let's sum it all up. Let's say I'm a patient coming to you. You've told me to limit the oils and the high fat foods that are really high in those omega six. But if I were to ask you, say, give me your top five plant based omega three sources. What is it that you're going to tell me specifically? Yeah, so it would be you know, adding a couple teaspoons or a tablespoon of flaxseed to your oatmeal in the morning, uh, sprinkling a tablespoon or so of hemp seed on, on a salad, uh, throw or some chia seed, throwing chia seed or flaxseed or hemp seed in a smoothie, um, um, you know, using a, you know, lots of green leafy vegetables in your soups and salads and, and things like that. Maybe putting a handful of walnuts uh, um, on your salad or in your, in your oatmeal in the morning. Um, that's the way you're going to be sure you're going to get plenty of, um, plenty of omega threes. All right. And we've got more resources up for you on PCRM.org. Just go ahead and search omega three. Let's change gears now. Time now to open up the doctor's mailbag for a Friday free for all. We're talking omega threes, vitamin D's, vitamin C's, any nutrient that you please go ahead and drop your question in the comment section right now. Dr. Loomis will get to as many of these as we possibly can. You ready to prescribe some answers for us, Dr. Loomis? Of course. All right. So this one is actually about B12. Uh, Nyla wants to know, can you talk to us about the daily amount of B12 we should be getting and what are the dangers then of taking too much of it? Yeah, that's a great question. So um, B12 is a nutrient of concern on a plant-based diet. Now, there is some misconceptions about what B12 really is or where it really comes from. Uh, people perceive it comes from meat and we don't eat meat. We can't get B12. That's not true. Um, B12 actually comes from bacteria that live in dirt. So they're, they're called saprophytic, which means they like dirt. Um, and when we consume meat, we're actually consuming those bacteria that are kind of in and on the, the, the meat that came from the dirt. Um, interestingly, though, um, you know, most cows today are raised in confined feeding lots or CAFOs. And they're, it's very unsanitary and they're not exposed. They don't, they're not exposed to dirt. Um, so most meat, most cows and pigs and even chickens today are actually supplemented with B12 because they're not getting the healthy bacteria, they're the B12 from the bacteria. You know, historically, we didn't have to worry too much about that because we got our food out of the dirt. You know, you go pull up some carrots or gather up some food in the woods and we would kind of shake the dirt off and we'd eat it. Um, and, and we got B12. We would drink water that had bacteria in it. Um, um, and, you know, we got these bacteria that made B12 for us. Uh, unfortunately, we have we put so much stuff on our food today, um, you know, pesticides and herbicides. We have and we pollute the waters. We have to scrub all the dirt off. We have to chlorinate the water. So we've kind of lost that natural source. So um, the RDA for for um, uh, B12 is not that much. I think it's like five mil micrograms a day. So it's pretty low. Now, remember, though, you only absorb about 10 percent of the B12 that we consume. And as we get older, um, um, it becomes, we, we don't absorb it quite as well. Um, there's also a lot of other factors that can influence B12 absorption. For example, a lot of people take uh, medications to suppress stomach acid and we need stomach acid to absorb B12. So that can lower your absorption of B12. Um, 
So, you know, the kind of the conventional wisdom is, um, and what I found in practice, uh, about 500 micrograms a day supplementally um, for most people will, will get them into that normal uh, range where they need to be. Um, the, the, there are some foods like nutritional yeast, which have B12, but there's not a lot. B, nutritional yeast has about 50 um, micrograms per, tea, I think, tablespoon or teaspoon. So that's a lot of nutritional yeast to consume to get your B12. So the simplest thing is just to take a supplement. Um, um, the Many organizations suggest that any, even if you're not plant-based, if you're over 65, because uh, absorption rates go down, that everyone should be taking a B12 supplement. Mm -hmm. um, so, so that's what I take. It's, it's about 2,500 to 3,500 micrograms a week. Uh, again, the easiest we can do it once a week. You take one pill a week if you want it, but um, I, I would forget. So I take 500 a day is what I take personally. All right. Do we have another question? Yes, indeed we do. Uh, a couple of ones on this, actually. Uh, this one from Bulent at 1220 says, I believe cooking would destroy omega-3s in greens. Is that correct? You know what? I do not know the answer to that, but I can find out because I, right. I don't know. In general, in, in general, um, you know, cook, cooking versus raw is an interesting question. Um, and um and it comes up all the time. And what's interesting about that is there are some nutrients. So take tomatoes, for example. Um, tomatoes have a, 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 a polyphenol called lycopene, which is an antioxidant that's been shown to help prevent colon cancer. Um, um, I mean, prostate cancer in particular. Um, when, we, when we cook tomatoes, um, the lycopene content goes up, actually. Tomatoes also have a lot of vitamin C. And when we cook when we, when we, when we cook tomatoes, the vitamin C content goes down. So, and that's true for, you know, uh, many vegetables, they, some of the nutrients, you know, the, the concentrations go up or they get activated. And when we cook and some of them go down. So, so the strategy I use is to mix it up, right? So I might put some raw tomatoes on a salad, but then put some cooked tomatoes in a soup or a stew. Um, I might have raw bro broccoli as a snack with some hummus and, and then maybe roast some broccoli um, um, or, or you know, cook broccoli in a stir fry or something like that. So in general, um, um, mixing it up um, is important, but I don't know the answer specifically to cooking in omega-3. My, my, from what I recall, I, I don't think that that's necessarily true, but, but again, I, we can clarify that. And, and post a response. Yeah, absolutely. We can definitely get an answer out on a future show. Uh, next question comes to us from Josie at 1221. Do omegas help with weight loss? Um, I do not know of any evidence that the omegas help directly with weight loss. Um, oh, but by the way, let's go back to the B12 question real quick. Uh, sure. the, the one thing I did not address is what happens if you take too much B12, okay? Um, so the traditional wisdom has been that, uh, uh, that taking too much B12 probably is okay. A recent study, however, did suggest that, that people who have very, very, very high levels of B12, above a, you know, 1,100, somewhere in there, um, um, have a higher mortality rate, they die sooner. Kind of unclear what the mechanism is. Um, there's some concern it may increase cancer risk. Again, that, that evidence is not very strong. Um, Probably the best evidence around the overconsumption of B12 is acne. Um, there, there is, I think, a clearer association between the overconsumption of, of B12 and, and the development of acne. Um, you know, I, it, it's probably not that big a deal, but, the, but again, I monitor levels in my patients and try to keep them within that normal range. All right. This is a good question. I think that a lot of people are going to like this one. There it is. Does the term whole food include things like polenta and peeled apples or potatoes? What right. does whole food mean? So that's a that's a great question. And, um, and and I think it's especially relevant today because as vegan plant based foods have become uh, uh, more prevalent um, on the grocery store shelves and in and, and, and the in the minds of the general population, there is sometimes some conflation uh, around that. Um, so, you know, um, if, if you think about it, veganism historically comes from an ethical place, a place of compassion. Um, I mean, it's about not eating any products with 
that have animal product, any foods that have animal product, not wearing clothes that are made from animals, not using products tested on animals. So it's a compassionate lifestyle. You know, from a health standpoint, however, there are a lot of unhealthy foods that are vegan, right? So white flour is vegan, sugar is vegan, Oreos are vegan, Dr. Pepper is vegan, corn oil is vegan, right? Um, so so um, when people talk about a whole food plant-based diet, it's vegan in the sense that it doesn't contain animal products, but it also tries to eliminate these these. Um, um, these, these more, these very, very highly processed foods. So a, along that, so there's kind of a spectrum, right. To eating an apple, right. Which is clear, just an apple off the tree, clearly whole food plant-based, right. Um, and, and, and there's, and then you've got some foods like tofu or polenta or whole grain, you know, whole grain flour, um, which is made from whole foods for the most part. Um, um, you know, tofu, for example, is just, is, is you just take soy milk and you curdle it. Um, and then you, you, you scrape the curds off and press it in a block. And it's, it's, um, it's, um, it's, it's tofu or bean curd. If you see it sometimes on a, on a Chinese restaurant menu. Um, so it's not technically the whole bean, um, but, but it's, it, but it's not highly processed. Like for example, white flour. So, you know, again, I, I think that that focusing on foods that are that are the, the less the least processed foods you can eat, uh, uh, the better, um, you know, incorporating a little polenta into your diet. I, I use polenta. Um, um, and I like it. I don't eat it every day. Um, but but I think that that um, using you know foods that are it, just trying to stay as close to whole food definitely plant-based as possible is going to ensure you the, the greatest health that really, this really gets back to that question I, I talked about earlier about nutritional return on investment, because each, each time you process a food, um, you're taking away potentially some of the nutritional value, whether you're removing some of the fiber, um, you know, uh, just for example, like uh, uh, wheat is a perfect example of that. So, so a wheat, a, a grain of wheat has three main components. It has a bran on the outside, which is kind of a protective covering, lots of fiber. It has the wheat germ, which is the embryo of the plant. Um, and that's where the healthy, there's a healthy omega threes actually there, as well as other vitamins and minerals. And then you have the kernel of the, of the, of the, of the, the grain, which is mainly sugar. And it's called the endosperm, and that so so the idea is the drain falls on the ground. The brand kind of the the the, the, the brand acts as kind of a protective covering. The endosperm provides food for the embryo for the wheat germ until it can sprout, um, till it can uh, grow roots and sprout leaves to capture energy from the sun. That, that's and that's like any seed really. So. You know, so when we start to process that grain, we take the bran off, for example, and take the wheat germ out and, and, and take the endosperm and grind it up into flour. Um, you know, that's pretty highly processed. We've thrown away a lot of the nutritional value. And in fact, we've thrown away so much of the nutritional value, we have to enrich it. So when you see the term enriched white wheat, white flour, that's because you've thrown all the vitamins away. They literally spray the vitamins back on with a big sprayer. Right. Um, so. Um, Oftentimes, and, and because the wheat germ has those omega-3s, which can become rancid, it's not uncommon to see, you know, breads, for example, that, 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 that have had the wheat germ removed so they don't go rancid. And the way that the FDA allows labeling laws, you know, it's, you don't have to have a lot of kind of the whole grain to be called whole grain. So the more whole grain you can get closer to the, to the way the food was grown or is, is the best, right? So, you know, whole grain flour is better than white flour. Wheat berries are better than whole grain flour, um, better than white flour, et cetera. So um, there's kind of a spectrum and trying to stay on this, on the whole, the whole food end of the spectrum is going to be the most helpful, no doubt. All right. Let's see if we can squeeze in two more rapid fire style. First one. Oh, this is right up your alley, my friend. Uh, this one is from Arlene at 1223. Do you recommend any supplements or additional nutrients for older marathon runners and triathletes talking about people 60 and up? Well, being one of those people, um, myself, <laughs> an older triathlon, triathlete and marathon runner. Um, you know, I, not really. Um, um, not, not really. Um, I found personally, so, so, so I 
for those of you who may or not know, so last summer I turned 60 and to celebrate that I wanted to do something epic. So I did, a, I, I trained for and completed an Ironman triathlon, very intense training, many hours um, and, and needed lots of recovery, you know, to, trying to maximize recovery. Um, and so I, I made very liberal use of certain foods like beets. Um, uh, beets activate nitric oxide, which increase blood flow to muscles. There's some evidence that beets can um, increase your um, uh, endurance uh, aerobic performance by about 10%. So I would beat load before long workouts or before races. Um, I used a lot of uh, um, specific foods for recovery. I made a recovery shake that had um, uh, tart cherry juice and blueberries and kale and and chia seed and turmeric and ginger and black pepper and um, uh, a little maca powder. Sometimes I put a little spir spirulina in there for some extra omega-3s. Uh, so, um, and I would drink that. The, the, the tart cherry juice has been shown to prevent uh, delayed onset muscle soreness. Um, um, so, but, but the real key, and again, this, this isn't specific to someone who's 60 and over. This is really any, any endurance athlete. Or, um, it's really about, it's really about keeping your diet as clean as possible because you, you want your diet to be as, you know, exercise is an inflammatory process and you want to be, make your diet as anti-inflammatory as, as possible. And so I, you know, not that I eat unhealthy, um, in general, but I can tell you in the eight months that. I trained leading up to Ironman last summer. Uh, it was about as, as clean as I've ever eaten. Um, uh, again, because I'm trying to really mitigate the, the inflammation I'm inducing in my body uh, through the exercise, through an anti-inflammatory lifestyle, if you will, uh, you know, centered around healthy foods, antioxidants, anti-inflammatory foods, sleep and stress management. All right. Final question. See if you can get to this one in 30 seconds or less. Uh, this one is from Marie on Facebook. Do you have any advice about how to travel to other countries throughout the world and still be able to eat a healthy and plant-based diet? She says that is her biggest problem. Yeah. And that can be a challenge. Um, um, you know, certain, well, first of all, that, that, so that can be a challenge to eat a truly whole food, no oil, plant-based diet when you travel. I, that, it, it, that is true. It's easier. Um, I, I think uh, not only is the interest in plant-based nutrition you know, really skyrocketing here in the United States, we're seeing that worldwide. So it's much easier today than it was even a, a, few, a few years ago. Um, you know, most, most traditional cu cuisines are at least plant forward. You know, meat and dairy was, was really a, a condiment or flavoring historically. Um, but but I, I understand it can be um, uh, difficult sometimes to eat completely whole food plant based. You know, my suggestions would be that, you know, there's apps like Happy Cow, uh, which is worldwide um, um, and, and using an app like that to try to find uh, uh, vegan friendly, plant based friendly restaurants in the town that you're in. Um, you know, talking to the if you're going to a nicer restaurant, you know, engaging the chef or the staff and uh, even beforehand. So that let them know you're coming there and that you don't eat meat. I mean, most, most nicer restaurants in, anywhere you are in the world are more than willing to accommodate you. Um, but I, I think the happy cow app, especially is your friend uh, when you travel. And again, that, that does have a worldwide presence. All right. And uh, by the way, Dr. Loomis, Kat and Elaine there uh, in the chat room, they both say congratulations on doing the uh, Ironman triathlon for your birthday. That's that's pretty epic. Uh, yeah. If we did not get to your question today, don't worry, we will save it and try to get you an answer on a future show. And yes, we will be revisiting that uh, question that Dr. Loomis is going to research the answer to. We will bring that to you next week. And also, if uh, someone, Dr. Loomis, has a question that they would like to ask you privately, they can make an appointment to see you at the Barnard Medical Center via the Wonders of telemedicine. That's correct. And um, um, we now are licensed. Uh, uh, we, we have providers uh, licensed in, I think, what, 15, 20 states now. Um, we just added Texas just uh, this last week, I think. But uh, Washington State, California, Texas, uh, Georgia, and Illinois, Missouri, Pennsylvania, New York. Uh, yeah, the list there at the bottom of the screen. Um, so if you live in any of those states and you'd like to see um, a, um, a provider from BMC, um, uh, give us a call. We can we can hook you up. Uh, we also are offering in many of these same states and more to add, uh, we're able to offer nutrition counseling as well with one of our dietitians. Um, you don't necessarily even need to be a patient um, uh, at, at BMC 
to, to, to uh, see our dietitian, you would just need to get a referral from your primary care doctor. But we're able to do that again through telehealth in many of these states. And we're adding states, both uh, providers in different states, but also the ability to do um, 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 uh, nutrition consultation as well. And speaking of referral, somebody this week was asking whether or not BMC took insurance. I'm not quite sure how that works with telemedicine. What what can you yeah, tell so, us? So, um, you know, we, we participate in almost every plan. Um, and um, now there may be some plans that are, we might be out of network for uh, locally. But we take Blue Cross Blue Shield, United Healthcare, Aetna, Cigna, Medicare, um, so, um, you know, the, 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 um, um, we, we can kind of help when you call, if, if you're interested in you call for a point, we can kind of help, we can, we have a list of, 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 of insurance plans, uh, and can kind of help navigate that for you or give you the tools to navigate it. Right. Dr. Loomis greatly appreciate your time, my friend. Enjoy your holiday weekend. All right. Thank you. Take care. Good to see you again. And a quick programming note, there will not be an exam room live on Monday due to the Labor Day holiday, but we will be right back here with Dr. Neil Barnard and Dr. Ann Lamb next Tuesday. We're going to be talking about some controversial new experiments involving animals that are being conducted by SpaceX founder Elon Musk. So they're searching for a cure for paralysis, but the question is, is there a way to do this research that does not involve putting animals in harm's way. We'll be discussing that on Tuesday's show. But for now, that is all the time that we have. My thanks to the very best crew in the biz that makes all this magic happen behind the scenes. And on behalf of Dr. Jim Loomis and everyone here at the Physicians Committee, I am the weight loss champion, Chuck Carroll. Thanks so much for tuning in, exam roomies. And until next week, stay safe, take a stand, and keep it